Uh, welcome uh, to the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. We're very delighted to see you and uh, want to uh, give a special welcome back to Ambassador Mike Hammer. Um, today's program is in partnership uh, with the US Africa Institute. And I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Tadeo Spile, uh, who is the founding president of the board of directors of the US Africa Institute, whose mission is to promote academic partnership between the US and African academic institutions through student faculty exchanges, academic research partnership, and citizen diplomacy. And Dr. Belay will in a minute introduce our special guest and also moderate today's uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Belay was recently a human rights fellow at the United States Human Rights Network. He has also served as a principal representative to the United Nations Economic and Social Council. He has earned recognition award from the California State Assembly and the 15th California Assembly District uh, as a community change maker and received the seventh annual Juneteenth Image Award. Dr. Tadios uh, Ville attended the University of San Francisco School of Law and School of Education, where he specialized in multicultural education and international law. He earned his doctoral degree in global education policy at USC. So welcome back to you as well. So Dr. Billy, I turn it to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. J, uh, for the introduction and welcome everyone uh, to our panel conversation today. And uh, welcome Ambassador Mike. We met uh, last time when I was in, in Addis uh, and it's a pleasure to host you today uh, here in Los Angeles. So a little bit about you know, our organization, the US African Institute. Uh, uh, we are uh, we are an academic institution uh, established to promote uh, the strategic relationship between the United States and an African nations through a number of uh, projects, including public diplomacy, dialogues, and conversations like this one. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone, uh, once again for uh, coming today. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, uh, read out uh, Ambassador Mike Hammer. You know, he's uh, such, you know, uh, uh, seasoned uh, diplomat, you know, has done a lot of work uh, for the continent of Africa, and we appreciate your leadership and guidance in bringing peace uh, to the continent and, and uh, particularly, you know, to uh, the uh, Horn of Africa region. Uh, so Ambassador Mike Hammer uh, uh, was named the United States Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa on June 1, 2022. His most recent assignment abroad was as the U.S. Ambassador to the Democratic Republic of the Congo from 2018 to 2022. Ambassador Hammer is a cared member of the Senior Foreign Service uh, class of Minister Counselor. He's over three decades of service, including serving as acting senior vice president of the National Defense University and a deputy uh, commandant of the NDU's uh, as, as an hour school. He served as uh, the US ambassador to Chile from 2014 to 2016. Uh, prior to his appointment in Chile, Ambassador Hammer served as uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs from March 2012 uh, to August 2013. Before joining the Bureau of uh, Public Affairs, Ambassador Hammer served as the White House as Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director for Press and Communication, and National Security Council spokesperson from uh, January 2009 to January 2011. He previously served as uh, he previously served at the National Security Council as deputy uh, spokesperson or spokesman from uh, 1999 to 2000, and as the director of Indian Affairs from 2000 to 2001. Ambassador Hammer's overseas uh, postings include Bolivia. Norway, Iceland, and Denmark. His other State Department assignments include 
the operations center and serving as special assistant to the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Ambassador Hamza has, has received several awards, including the, Na the Navy's Distinguished Public Service Award, the State Department's uh, Distinguished Honor Award, the Department's uh, Edward R. Morrow Award for Excellence in Public Diplomacy, and several Superior Honor uh, Awards. Ambassador Hammer earned a bachelor's degree from the from George uh, from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He also earned a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University from uh, and from the National War College at the National Defense University. So, uh, so with that, uh, I think you know we can start in you know, the conversation, Ambassador Mike. So we have uh, a few questions from the registrants. You know, before we open up the conversation uh, uh, with our uh, attendants here, uh, if, do do we have a, a copy of the questions here or no? Well, let, let me just uh, or, get started. Yeah, if you can just make. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Th thank you for coming on, on a Monday morning. This was a very special weekend here at USC with a graduation. Uh, in fact, uh, my daughter just graduated from Annenberg, and so very, very pleased and delighted to be back in LA. And and I, I like the, the African tradition. We all go by first main, name. So thank you, Dr. J. Thank you, Dr. Tadius, uh, for, for hosting us here. And of course, thank you, uh, fellow uh, colleague Nora, who helped arrange this. Uh, it is really a, a pleasure for me to be able to be here, and I'm glad we have kind of an intimate group, and I know there are some folks online so that we can have, uh, as I said, a conversation about uh, U.S. policy uh, towards Africa, but I mean, I'm mostly focused on the horn. Um, I prepared a PowerPoint, but maybe the PowerPoint really is uh, too simplistic, really, for this uh, very distinguished audience, and so we may forego the PowerPoint really in, in favor of a conversation, but let me make a few points um, at the top about uh, U.S. policy towards the continent and about uh, U.S. policy in the Horn of Africa. Uh, first, uh, I think that it should be well recognized that uh, President Biden, in only his uh, first month in office in February of uh, 2021, uh, addressed the, the African Union uh, Heads of State Summit in, in Addis via video. And in that uh, video message, he made clear that the United States wants to have a relationship with the continent based on partnership, recognizing that Africa needs to be very much a part of working with us and us with Africa to address global challenges. No uh, one country uh, can address uh, the really very difficult issues that the globe faces today, and specifically issues like uh, climate change, uh, poverty eradication, fighting uh, pandemics, uh, things that uh, clearly are cross-border and that impact all, all citizens. And in that message, he made clear that the United States was prepared to support uh, the African Union and African institutions and countries in promoting African solutions to African problems. And the reason I begin with that is because I feel that in the work that I was privileged to be assigned to do uh, last June of uh, last year, uh, being named uh, Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, we've lived that. And I will describe how we lived it. Uh, let me also emphasize that the, the Biden administration recognized the importance of the Horn of Africa uh, by appointing a special envoy. We don't have special envoys for all issues. We have them for those that are really salient, the strategic and important, and usually when there's a crisis. And in my case, uh, uh, following up upon my predecessors, the goal was to try to bring peace to Northern Ethiopia, a conflict that was tearing the country apart. And one that was underreported in uh, news headlines around the world. Uh, uh, more people were dying in Ethiopia than anywhere else uh, from the conflict. Uh, and we, don't, we know in the United States, for example, and across the world, more headlines were being uh, focused on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, while at the same time, there was a very tragic situation happening in northern Ethiopia. And so President Biden, Secretary Blinken, 
uh, felt it very important that we try to do what we could as, as the United States to try to bring an, an end to that conflict. Uh, part of my mandate is also to work on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the disputes uh, that are present between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Uh, clearly in the headlines today, it's actually not Ethiopia, uh, it's Sudan. And I'm sure you're interested in talking about that as well. Uh, our Assistant Secretary Mali Fee, in fact, is uh, in Ethiopia today uh, after being in Jeddah trying to work on trying to get a, a ceasefire there in a humanitarian corridor to do the coordination that is required and that we feel is absolutely necessary with the African Union, with other African partners, with African leaders in the region uh, to try to, again, uh, address a really difficult uh, situation now currently in Sudan. Uh, let me again just say a couple things on how this partnership between the United States and the continent has uh, helped to deliver on an African solution to an African problem. And that is the whole process that took place in Pretoria in November of last year, which led to the cessation of hostilities agreement. Uh, you may be familiar that uh, the African Union was uh, working to try to bring an end to the conflict and that then uh, Pre President Biden uh, made a speech at the UN General Assembly last year in September in which he made very clear that the United States supports an African Union-led process. And from the moment that I took my job, uh, immediately went to Addis, met with the African Union with Chairperson Faki and some of his colleagues to see how the United States might be able to support that process. Uh, it all came together with the African Union uh, appointing a high-level panel that you may be familiar with, with, uh, well, former President Obasanjo, who was this high representative uh, for uh, the conflict, for the Horn, for, on behalf of the African Union. And that included also uh, former president of Kenya, Uhura Kenyatta, and then Madame Pumzile, former vice president of the uh, Republic of South Africa. Uh, through that process, uh, the South African government uh, was uh, uh, bold enough to offer to host uh, the talks that took place in November of uh, last year. And at that time, clearly, there wasn't much expectation that an agreement could be reached. Uh, after all, the war had raged for two years. There had been a humanitarian truce that had been worked out, uh, but the parties uh, uh, from the federal government and the grand authorities had gone back to war. Uh, through a period of approximately 10 days of very intense talks, uh, the remarkable happened. Uh, and it happened because, again, of a very strong leadership from the African Union, from that high level panel, and with support of observers that included the United Nations, uh, EGAD, uh, and uh, the United States. And I was proud uh, to have been a part of, of that effort. And it produced a, a cessation of hostilities agreement that nearly instantly silenced the guns. It stopped the fighting uh, within really the first 24 to 48 hours, but much work remained. And in fact, one of the first things that was decided in Pretoria is that there would be a follow-on uh, military commanders meeting uh, within five days in Nairobi. And exactly within five days, that meeting took place. So we all went from Pretoria to Nairobi, and then that uh, led to more concrete commitments in terms of the cessation of hostilities agreement, what it meant uh, in terms of disarmament of Tigrayan forces, to be done concurrently with the withdrawal of foreign forces, which were understood to be Eritrea, and of other non-Ethiopian uh, uh, national defense forces. Mm -hmm. And for the ensuing six months, and now it has been just over six months that the agreement has been in place, uh, quite remarkably, the peace has held. We have seen the uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, resume and almost completely unimpeded throughout uh, northern Ethiopia. We have seen the restoration of services uh, that uh, electricity, telecommunications, and banking. Uh, we have seen disarmament take place. We have seen the Eritrean forces withdraw mostly to the border area, uh, but the work is not done. We also more recently saw that uh, the interim regional administration was established uh, with uh, now a new uh, President Getachew Reda, and I had the privilege of going to Mekele 
into Gray about three weeks ago now uh, and had an opportunity to meet with the interim regional administration then. And uh, we discussed you know, what needs to happen and uh, participated in a, an event that uh, Prime Minister Abi hosted uh, in which recognized that the peace was holding, uh, but also that more work needs to be done to ensure that that peace endures. That includes uh, the value and importance of having a disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program uh, that uh, takes care of ensuring that uh, the peace is maintained, as well as major reconstruction needs for all the destruction that happened in northern Ethiopia that affected Amhara, Tigray, uh, and Afar. Uh, and beyond that, we've also, as the United States, been encouraging that there be uh, diplomatic and efforts to resolve uh, other uh, conflicts like what is happening in Oromia. And you just recently saw talks that were hosted uh, in Tanzania uh, between uh, the OLA and the Ethiopian government, um, a first round. And so uh, we want to encourage, as the United States, peaceful resolution to some of these very difficult conflicts. We offer our uh, resources, our expertise, our partnership to try to see what can be done uh, to advance uh, peace uh, in Ethiopia. Now, currently, we're trying to do similarly in Sudan in very difficult and complex uh, environments. Uh, rest assured that the United States uh, and U.S. taxpayers uh, should be very proud of the assistance the United States provides uh, to people in need who are suffering either from uh, man-made, and you can really say it's man-made because it's mostly men who are in the leadership positions uh, of conflict, and also uh, to address uh, natural uh, disasters or conditions like the drought that we're seeing uh, that's leading to potential famines, and that's a, a clear uh, recognition that more needs to be done globally, uh, as the Biden administration has put a premium, on combating climate change. Uh, and so it is through these you know, cooperative arrangements that we hope to improve uh, the lives of, of, of fellow Africans who are in, in need. And uh, our relationships really are, are critically important uh, for the future of the continent, but really for the future of the world. Let me just end, since we're here at Annenberg and where the focus is a lot on, uh, and rightfully should be on public diplomacy, how important it is for the United States to communicate what it is that we're doing. We have competitor nations uh, who have a very different approach to uh, their relationships uh, with other countries. The United States prides itself in investing in people, in trying to provide an education to have exchanges, cultural exchanges, uh, sports exchanges, academic exchanges uh, that bring people together. Because at the end of the day, what I've experienced through nearly 35 years of diplomacy is that we as people have common goals and objectives uh, for ourselves and for our children. We want to live in peace, in security, without fear. We want to have an education or an ability for our children to pursue an education. We want to have economic opportunity uh, and jobs. And we want to be able to lead healthy lives and have the, the ability to, to protect ourselves from, from disease. And these core essential needs and, and uh, interests are what the United States stands for, and what we try to do in our diplomatic relations uh, with other countries. We don't only engage with governments. Yes, government to government relations are uh, necessary, but we want to engage with people. Uh, we want to engage with the youth. We want to engage with the business sector. We want to engage with uh, all uh, those who add so much uh, perspective to each, each country and want to be engaged with people outside of capitals. And so public diplomacy enables us to do that, to use the tools of social media to connect. I've had the privilege of serving as an ambassador twice uh, and found that the use of uh, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or now new platforms, whether it's Instagram, whatever it is that where people can connect really allows you to explain what the American government perspective is to have respectful disagreements, even though on social media, it's not always uh, quite respectful. In fact, on Twitter, if you follow uh, things relating to Ethiopia, it, unfortunately, it's quite toxic. But also there's the concern of now disinformation. I was just talking to Jay about this, that this is a real challenge 
for this generation is what is truth, what is fact, and what is clearly purposeful disinformation, or just uh, an effort to influence by putting out wrongful information. And that's a real important responsibility for the US government to ensure that we are doing the utmost to only put out things that are factually accurate and to counter uh, those efforts by others who are trying to shape uh, minds and thought uh, by putting out false uh, information <clears throat> and creating uh, false narratives. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'll drink some more smart water that'll help my presentation. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's it's really important, uh, you know, as we recruit now for the next generation of diplomats, that uh, they have the benefit of, you know, those that are privileged to come and study in an institution like this one here at USC in Annenberg or elsewhere um, to really um, understand, you know, what how important it is to communicate and to engage. And I very much appreciate those uh, others who, you know, found institutions like the U.S. Africa Institute that look at exchanges, that look to how do we bring people together, because that's what diplomacy is about. It's about people and understanding. And uh, the United States, I, you know, feel we're privileged in that when people come here, they generally have a very positive experience. It's not about our politics. It's about who we are uh, and how we engage and and uh, really about our culture and our history. And so we may not be perfect, but a lot of countries around the world or people around the world aspire to be more like the United States. And that's something that really is, is marketable and something that we should uh, certainly be pushing out. So now we've let the room fill out. So I'm grateful that uh, more people <laughs> yeah. have joined in. And I know there are questions. And again, I don't want to be talking at you, but rather really have a, a conversation about issues that are of importance to you. I, again, I don't cover the entire continent, so there may be issues that you raise that I won't uh, address, but I'll do my best. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Mike, for your uh, opening remarks. As you mentioned, uh, what we do at the U.S. African Institute is we engage the young generation, uh, uh, you know, in the diaspora as well as on the continent of Africa. We have a number of projects in South Sudan, Ethiopia, Niger, uh, and now we're developing a project in South Africa, and we're doing all this work in collaboration with academic institutions like USC, you know, to be able to promote public diplomacy. And we have received some questions uh, from uh, our attendees online, and one of, I have four questions, and then after that, I think, you know, we can open up the conversation to uh, our participants here. And the first question is, uh, many indicate that the root cause of ethnic conflicts and instability that caused thousands of lives and destruction in Ethiopia is its constitution. What's your opinion about that? And, and if you agree, is the US advising Ethiopia to amend the sections that divide the country and its people along ethnic lines? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, that's really a question that one needs to put forward to Ethiopians. I mean, the United States is interested in a positive relationship uh, with uh, Ethiopia. Yeah, uh, we take into account our values. Um, and after this horrific conflict, you know, President Biden and then now Secretary Blinken, who went to Addis in March, have conveyed very clearly that we want to see uh, a credible process of accountability and transitional justice. But as far as how to address some of the uh, issues, core issues uh, in Ethiopia that are continuing to lead to conflict, our main uh, objective is to encourage uh, the government and others to resolve these issues uh, through peaceful means, through dialogue, whether it's a national dialogue that's been uh, suggested that uh, it needs to be credible and inclusive. You know, issues relating to a country's, another country's constitution are for those citizens to decide. It's not for the United States to be uh, promoting one um, concept or another. We can share our own experience. We can offer, you know, uh, expertise on how constitutions have been drawn up uh, and share our own experience. But the, the key here is that the United States can use its influence uh, to, again, encourage uh, a, the peaceful resolution. Uh, what we're, we see time 
again on these wars that they become senseless wars. They don't really uh, further uh, conflict down the road in that you need to be able to work things out that addresses some of the past grievances uh, and then develop hopefully a political process. And of course, we're strong believers in a democratic process that's free, open, and fair um, that allows the, the citizens to decide on their leadership and that takes uh, matters uh, in, in the right direction. And if um, there are uh, not going in the right direction, then people need to then express their, their thoughts, vote people out and change leadership and then continue to evolve. But that's why the United States stands for um, democratic means and, again, peaceful resolution of these disputes. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, and the follow-up question, and again, this is you know, from our audience, uh, please comment on the Eritrean regime's inhuman treatment of its people and its uh, destabilizing role in the Horn of Africa. Well, we have a, a difficult relationship um, with Eritrea, primarily because the United States has spoken out uh, with great concern over uh, Eritrean violations uh, of human rights, uh, both in Eritrea, but more recently, specifically during the two-year war uh, in northern Ethiopia. I think uh, most of you, uh, this you know, very informed audience, knows that uh, in March, the State Department put out a an atrocities determination that found that uh, all uh, mil all militants and forces involved in the conflict committed war crimes, and uh, there were groups that also committed crimes against humanity, including Eritrean forces. And so that is an issue of concern uh, for the United States, and should be an issue of concern for the world, and hopefully something will be done to, to hold those responsible to account. We have uh, challenges uh, with Eritrea, and every time I travel to the region, it's an issue that is, is brought up, but uh, countries in the region need to decide for themselves what kind of relationships they have with Eritrea. Our hope is that there can be a, a better path forward and one which, again, leads to greater stability and not less. Okay, thank you. Uh... Uh, Ambassador Mike, you mentioned about uh, uh, disinformation and information, uh, misinformation, and there is a question related to that. Uh, uh, and in a post-truth America, how do we handle critical communications with allies and adver adversaries? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. I don't know if we're in a post-truth uh, America. Um, I, I had the privilege of, of working in the White House all the way back in 1999, so I date myself a little bit. And at that time, we had the, the Kosovo War. And I remember how important it was for us at the White House to be truthful in the way that we communicated with the American people and with the world uh, in, the, in the context of a conflict. You know, they, it's often said that, you know, the first thing to to get lost in war is, is the truth. And in order to, as a government, to maintain credibility, one needs to do the best job possible to speak to the facts and recognize if something has gone wrong. And during that conflict, a lot of the questions were oftentimes, if there was a, a bombing, were civilians injured or potentially killed? Who was responsible? And it was important to be again, open and transparent and recognizing when mistakes were made. You fast forward to today, uh, and it's a much more intense uh, media cycle. Uh, it's not just 24-7, what we used to then call the CNN effect. It is hyper, uh, and it is at warp speed, and it's not necessarily factually correct. Uh, or there can be just purposeful efforts, again, by adversaries to shape a conversation simply by putting out uh, false information. And so it becomes even more important for the U.S. government to maintain its credibility so that when individuals or countries uh, are looking to find out something, uh, that they can rely on the information that is provided. You know, it's, it's very difficult, uh, having been a spokesperson both at the White House and at the State Department and as an ambassador overseas, in the early mornings, uh, early moments of any kind of event, it's very confusing 
and it, and and there's a pressure to say something about whatever it is. A bomb has gone off somewhere, or some horrible incident has occurred, and and you don't know the facts. And the public tends to think that if the U.S. government doesn't speak in those first few moments, that somehow we're hiding uh, the truth or trying to be deceitful because we must be all knowing. And the reality is, having sat in in in, in, in on the inside when something happens, is no, you don't necessarily know what happened. And to say something that is inaccurate is, is worse than saying nothing at all. And so you need to fill the, the, the space and time with what you do know, but recognizing we're still trying to find out uh, rather than rush to say something that maybe later is, is proven to be wrong, not because you intentionally uh, meant to say it uh, uh, in a way that was deceptive, but because simply again, in the fog of war or in a moment of, an, uh, of a circumstance, you may not know exactly what happened. So it is really important, again, to, to maintain to the truth, as, as you know it, to recognize when mistakes are made and to be very much accessible and communicative uh, constantly. Uh, but you can't keep up with what is out there. It's just intense and coming at you from every direction. So you have to have a, a sense of purpose. You have to do the best that you can in communicating. And hopefully people will be well informed to know that certain sources of information are not reliable and that they are purposefully trying to disinform. And to that effect, uh, you know, it's important that the United States point that out as well. Uh, but I think for all of us, we have to consider what is the news source that we are getting information from? Are we getting it because it's a trusted news source or is it because it agrees with your particular political uh, perspectives? Um, the realities out there can be interpreted in, in different ways. And so to be a critical thinker, you need to be open to other thoughts and to challenge sometimes what, what you're listening to. But uh, I recognize that it it is more difficult. And we haven't even gotten to, we talked a little bit before this started on AI. And when you're starting to create really things that are not actually um, true uh, or that uh, misrepresent uh, someone, uh, that is a, a scary thought. And we'll, I'm sure, evolve as a society trying to figure out institutions like Annenberg will be, I'm sure, at the forefront and trying to work on these. We heard it from the speakers at commencement. The AI came out Constantly, it's something for this next generation. But uh, um, I'm confident that you know, through you know, good analysis and uh, dedication of of those that want to preserve uh, the truth, that there still will be a, a truth out there that that people can can rely on. You just have to be much more critical in what you see. Um, understand that what you see may not be what it is, uh, which is a, a difficult thought. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mike. Uh, I know we have a lot of, you know, people attending us, you know, online uh, from different African countries, Kenya, I know uh, from Niger and in South Sudan. And also here our attendees are, you know, expecting, you know, to share some questions. But before that, the last question is, I know you have done a lot of work on the, Gerda, which is the Grand Ethiopian, Ethiopian Re Renaissance Dam. Uh, there is a question uh, related to the dam. What's the status of Ethiopia, Egypt cooperation? Uh, related to the Grand Renaissance Dam, is progress being made? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, there's uh, under the African Union, uh, and I had the privilege when I was ambassador in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there was a ministerial meeting on the Grand Ethiopian Dam when President Chisikedi was then the acting president for the, the African Union uh, at that time. And so as part of my portfolio, I have responsibility for trying to, to see what can be done to settle some of the, the issues that relate to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. You may be familiar that it's um, in its fourth filling, it's nearly complete. And what we're trying to uh, work with uh, the three parties, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, is to recognize that, that there are ways, technical means for how that dam uh, can operate that doesn't create significant harm for the downstream countries of Sudan and Egypt, that addresses Egypt's existential concerns about water, that ensures that it's done in a safe way that doesn't negatively uh, affect uh, Sudan because of potential flooding and so forth, which in fact the dam can help with, 
And that also provides an opportunity for greater development and regional energy integration in the region. So our focus is diplomatically trying to convince all three countries that cooperation, as opposed to mistrust, is the best way forward. Uh, we have been engaged in trying to, as the Biden administration, to support any efforts that convince all three countries that it's in their best interest to reach an agreement. Obviously, the situation in Sudan makes it more difficult in terms of who can make decisions for the country at the moment. But rest assured, again, that the Biden administration will continue to try to see how uh, the three countries might come to uh, understandings that will lead to greater cooperation and certainly a spur greater economic development that addresses all three countries' uh, needs as, as it relates to, to water and, and energy. And even more broadly in the region, um, there are so many opportunities to grow a development. But the, one of the basic uh, essential needs for promoting development is stability and security. And you don't have that when you have ongoing raging conflicts. So uh, we have tough work ahead, but rest assured, we're working on it every day. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your response. And now I think, you know, we can open up the conversation you know, just to make it you know, more engaging. Uh, I know we have Cesar here and also Kofi uh, uh, from the U.S. African Institute, so they can help us, you know, facilitate the conversation here. So if you have any questions or comment on what Ambassador uh, said, uh, you know, it could be related to uh, the region or, you know, in general, you know, uh, U.S. Africa relationship. Thank you, Ambassador Hammer, for your uh, very uh, informative and better now. So that's for the online audience only. Oh, okay. Yes. So it's fine. Okay. Um, so I appreciate you uh, being here. And it's actually for us to, to I'm uh, Eritrean American and I'm very active in the Eritrean uh, diaspora, pro-democracy and human rights advocacy. And so maybe my question is in regards to that. I mean, we know the Eritrean government has been the, the difficult uh, uh, regime in the area of Horn of Africa, if not <laughs> beyond. Uh, so in terms of that, in terms of engaging the Eritrean diaspora pro-democracy, uh, uh, movement or pro-democracy uh, diaspora community, what efforts have you done or you plan to, to do in, in order to engage that in terms of providing alternative for the regime in Eritrea? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, thank you. For, no, no, let her keep the microphone because I'm going to have a question for her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is interactive. So okay, great. <laughs> if you ask, I might ask you a question back. So, hey, my uh, name is Saba. Okay, <laughs> super. No, I mean, Look, we have, as, as I said at the top, a very strained relationship uh, with uh, the current Eritrean regime, uh, and that makes it difficult to have a conversation about almost any topic. So we welcome thoughts that you might have. That's why I was you know, asking you to keep the mic. What would you recommend? What are the kinds of things that you think could be useful in trying to promote a, a better relationship and certainly to try to promote the kind of uh, relationship between our two countries that we'd like to see? Well, one will be to engage the Eritrean diaspora, especially the uh, pro-democracy. I, for myself, for example, I am uh, the co-founder of Eritrean Satellite Television, which is the, the first Eritrean Satellite Independent. You can imagine, of course, we all know there is no independence media in Eritrea that we're broadcasting in five different Eritrean languages there to inform, engage, empower, and of course, inspire the Eritrean community to, to be able to be uh, agents of change for themselves. So, and that's one, one, one of the small efforts that we're doing. And also there is another uh, efforts and uh, grouping that the Eritrean community have started in 2019. It's called the ACID, which means enough in Tigrinya, that people organize in over 42 cities in the United States. And now we have also actually globally ACID, which means we have about 12 countries in the world that are organized under that to be an alternative and a voice for the Eritrean public that has been oppressed and actually creating not only for the Eritrean uh, people, but also the countries of the region. We have we have seen what happened to uh, Ethiopia, the Tigrayans in the last two years. And we follow, we closely follow. In fact, you probably have seen Ambassador uh, Stephen Walker uh, tune in from Asmara on Erasat on our first symposium last year. So uh, these are the things I think that we want to see a sort of uh, uh, 
in initiation, we've been trying to approach and to get engaged with the uh, uh, the State Department or the American, I mean, uh, the individual also at the uh, government level. So I think there are these things, small things that we can uh, get a sort of engagement from the diaspora community that could be a very positive effect in terms of public diplomacy that we're talking about also and creating that sort of hope for the Eritreans inside the country that have been looking out and watching out to see some sort of positive interaction between the Eritrean diaspora and the, the US government and other democratically uh, uh, pushing countries and organizations. Well, thank you very much. Make sure to give your contact information to Nora. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Can I go? Yeah. Please. Yeah. I, I, I just want to add to what Dr. Sara uh, Saba was saying. Uh, I'm also from Eritrea. I am actually a faculty here at USC at the engineering department. So thank you for the Annenberg uh, Institute here for collaboration with the African Institute to have this uh, and bring uh, some distinguished speaker here. We really appreciate you being at USC and uh, I didn't know your daughter went to USC. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I think the engagement, what uh, I really needed is really to engage the Eritrean in the diaspora, especially there is pretty active uh, members in the US, uh, uh, Eritrean American uh, members of all sorts, which are really aspiring a better Eritrea. Uh, and I do belong to the Eritrean political forces, which are also very highly organized, trying to really bring some democratic change in Eritrea as well. So I think we really need to, we are also hoping the U.S. Uh, really be active in trying to find a better solution for the people in Eritrea, uh, as well as for the Horn of Africa, because one bad uh, actor in that region really creates really havoc to the whole region. And that's really how we have, uh, we have looked at this thing. And uh, I think your effort the recent effort you have done in Af in Ethiopia uh, is really very, very admirable. And we really want to have that engagement and that peaceful process going all over in East Africa. And what we see in Sudan is really is sad situation. And hopefully, I hope you will say something about the Sudan uh, if, uh, issue also, because this is really uh, most urgent in that part of the world right now where people are really dying left and right. So we do really need some peace in the region. But going back to the Afri to the Eritrean issue, and I guess it's really going beyond uh, really recognition what the African, what the Eritrean issue should be, because as we speak, the president of Eritrea is in China. And I guess he's really disseminating all kinds of uh, wrong information about what the region is. And I don't think that's really is helpful to the situation in the Horn of Africa, bringing other really bad actors to the situation, which is already bad uh, in East Africa. So uh, hopefully uh, you will, will engage and hopefully will, this engagement will lead to some better uh, future for Eritrea and the Horn of Africa. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and welcome. Um, I wish we had this conversation two, three years ago. Um, my comments, my concern is an American citizen, what the Democratic Party is doing to the country on the African continent. During the Obama time, we've done expected some independency, autonomy in the African continent, but we didn't see that much. And the Biden administration is just cut and paste of the Obama administration, including the staff. That's the problem. So we just want to know as fellow Democrat, we support being Democrat party, if there is any new envision to Africa, the way you do strategy and polit political, because what was the common thing is, let's say Chad, let's go to Congo, Cameroon, Somali, now Sudan, next to Ethiopia. We go to Libya, we go to, um, what is it, Yemen, all that's going on during Obama and also Biden administration. So my concern as an American citizen, am I gonna be trusting this government to do good or we're just elaborating work instead of working with the people at the ground who's suffering, children and family, 
working with the government, sometimes godfathering the wrongdoing government. This is a, we like to see any conspiracy, in you know, transparency work. So we can say proudly, go for election, whoever represent not the United States of America and democracy, but also the, the corner of Africa or the continent of Africa. Because although we hear part of us concern, you know, the best interest of other groups, including here. So this, we really appreciate the continued conversation, the actual people uh, who concern and also represent all unity in Africa and power, not just the government or some other ethnic leaders. We so we, my question would be, is there anything coming for the new election going on, have different way of strategy approaching how to deal with African continent? More so if you like to work with safety of the Horn of Africa, which is the heart of Africa, then you need to speak or connecting with the people, not the leaders who are doing the business is all about. So we are representing the community and the population as a citizen. Um, that's why we're asking, hopefully we see something new for Democrat party to come up with or bind but the policy of autonomy of Africa. But we don't see that. And honestly, United States has a big power. We're so proud to be here, but we also want to see some change to be done. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just answer, and I don't know at, at what point you, you walked in as I was speaking, and I'm not speaking on behalf of any party, but as the U.S. government and the, as a representative of the State Department and the Biden administration, that the President Biden <clears throat> made a, a real important commitment uh, in talking to the African Leaders Summit uh, here that uh, he hosted in Washington in December, but also in his second month in office in February of, of 20. 21, when he talked to the African Union and its leadership and committed to be a, a country of the United States in partnership with the continent to help advance African solutions to African problems. And it's been in that spirit that whether it's the work that I do as a special envoy for the Horn or my colleagues uh, in the State Department, Assistant Secretary Molly Fee or Secretary Blinken or people at the White House, that we look for opportunities where we can work together as, as equals. Uh, to advance the, the interest of our citizens, Americans and Africans, depending on what country, obviously, in Africa you're uh, talking about. And that we put out, uh, and the reason I put up the slide, I didn't want to bore the audience with the whole presentation, but it's handy. It talks about how we've reframed our priorities uh, for Africa uh, in the national security strategy that was put out in August 2022. And so we do have a framework for engagement, for how the United States is gonna work with our African partners to try to address the issues of, of, of most salient concern. And as you'll see there, you know, how do we work together to combat climate change? This is a global effort that needs to take place that the, leader, that the Biden administration has taken the leadership role. And how do you bring an end to conflict working with African institutions like the African Union as we did uh, in Pretoria to end the conflict mm -hmm. in, in Northern Ethiopia, or as we're doing now, working with others. Uh, as I mentioned, my colleague Molly Fee, our Assistant Secretary is in Addis, meeting with African Union leadership on the crisis in Sudan and talking to regional leaders and partners. And so together we can accomplish more than alone. Uh, we recognize that. And uh, where the United States can play uh, uh, an important role, we, were, we are prepared uh, to do so, uh, to get uh, the perspectives of the countries that we're working with and to, to advance you know, our core values uh, of democracy, of uh, respect for human rights, of trying to create economic opportunity, to try to help uh, combat pandemics, uh, for example, or health crisis, and to help those in need in terms of humanitarian assistance. And uh, as I mentioned previously, the United States is the largest donor of humanitarian assistance to Ethiopia and, and throughout the continent. We are the most generous. So thank you to you, all the American citizens here uh, who are uh, contributing through your taxes and the U.S. Agency for International Development does the best job that it can to make sure that that assistance goes to save lives, to better people's lives. And I'm very proud of the work that we do. Oh, can I say just one little response to that as well? Um, that's my colleague, Nora Dempsey, yeah. for anybody who hasn't <laughs> met her. So also from the State Department. Ambassador Hammer and I have both had long careers with the State Department in, in our in our joint uh, experience, 
the role I'm in right now is a first ever for the State Department. Never before has anybody been selected to be to engage just with the Ethiopian diaspora, just with the diaspora. I spend all my time speaking to Ethiopian diaspora and to listening to them. It's why we're here. We're, we, I was appointed right at the time that the no more protests were being held weekly in front of the State Department and the White House. And we realized we needed to actually get in touch and to hear better from the citizenry who knew the country and the problem so intimately. And so we've learned a lot. And that's why we're here. And I think it's it's a great thing. It's a great thing that we're that this administration had the wisdom to say, wait a minute, the citizens who are from Ethiopia have a lot of information, a lot of anecdotal truth, a lot of influence. We know it's key. Ethiopian diaspora are key to a positive democratic solution for Ethiopia. Thank and that was also true from the African Leader Summit that was just held in December. Now we have a coordinator for um, diaspora engagement out of the White House. So uh, again, more is being done to connect with the different uh, diaspora who have, as, as Nora says, uh, a very valuable perspective to share with the U.S. government to help us shape our policies. So thank you. Ambassador, yes. Uh, yes. hi, yes. John Roberts. I'm a doctoral student here at Rosier, but uh, also been working in West Africa for 15 years in international development. Um, I, I have a question really about your job is which seems almost impossible <laughs> is you have diaspora who are actually constituents right who have elected the current government here in the united states who have reasonable agendas in line with our values uh american values but then you have an international order which respects the sovereignty of nation states and you have issues like global pandemics which need global solutions and then you have regimes going from, I mean, your, your career did not stop with the Trump administration, right? You have regimes going back and forth from calling countries shithole countries to wanting to, you know, really empower people through reasonable means. And so how do you navigate that yeah. in any sort of reasonable and productive format? It mm -hmm. seems almost impossible. Yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And the jobs are challenging, but I can tell you there's nothing more rewarding, I think, Nora. And I can, can both say that. And uh, to any of the students who may be listening, although uh, right after graduation, they're probably not, they're probably still recovering, <laughs> uh, that uh, you know, to be able to, to serve the country uh, and working at the State Department as a civil servant or as a foreign service officer abroad is, is a great privilege to represent the United States. And warts and all, whatever uh, you might think of where we are in our history, and we have some you know, important issues that, that we're dealing with at home, we're still a pretty good and excellent guiding example for for other countries, and it is uh, you know the, you know the job of representing the United States is one I take great pride in, and to have have these conversations with foreign audiences for them to better understand because we tend to be very transparent, very open, very engaging, much more so than most countries. I mean, we can take criticism; it's okay um, as long as it's done respectfully. And there's a lot of power in that. Uh, I, I can tell you a lot of other ambassadors when I'm out there representing other countries won't sit <laughs> and take it. But uh, it's not a question of sitting and taking it. It's just having an exchange. It's, it's, it's recognizing, you know, where our faults are. Uh, I've heard it from our presidents, you know, that we're, we're working towards a more perfect union. We are not perfect. We recognize that. And I think it's important to recognize that democracy is a work in progress that we all as citizens need to continue to invest in. You cannot take it for granted. And you especially see that when you serve abroad. So, uh, you know, when, when you serve abroad, you develop a greater appreciation for the strength, beauty, diversity of the United States. And when you come back, you say, wow, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, look around, look where we are. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty uh, powerful. And so uh, what I would say is that Yes, the challenges are, are extremely difficult, but um, our mission is is one that is 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 so critically important. I mean, if you're trying to make the world a better place, and that's what I would tell any students or any young person or any of you who want to join the State Department, if you want to make the world a better place, I don't see a better place to do it than working through diplomacy in whatever field of interest you have and trying to engage people not only governments and yours, you know, you've brought up, you know, the relationships with governments, but yes, we do need to, but it's reaching everyone else that, that becomes so critically important because um, that's, that's where 
the future is being uh, prepared and the, and the groundwork is being done for what will be the, you know, the, the relationships be, between countries. And again, that commonality, the common humanity uh, is, is what you know, bonds us together. And so, be able to to share that is is critically important. So, I appreciate the challenge, but it's it's one very very well worth doing. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been doing it for uh, now almost thirty five years. But thanks for your question, John. Yeah, I think there's a gentleman yeah. in the back. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's somebody here. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hammer, for coming uh, because it's very insightful. And this is what we always, uh, you know, want to see the government extending their, their uh, uh, the communication and their relations to the West Coast. Because um, I know the governments, the American governments like to, to deal with the ambassadors, the people who are representing directly the governments. But unfortunately on the West Coast, which is like a 99 countries represented, only about uh, 11, 11 African countries represented. We feel like, you know, we, we need to be more involved with the government and see what we can do for our respective countries. We have the, our constituents, we have a lot of issues ha happening and then we are the one they call when something happened, just doing what the ambassadors are doing. And I feel like the government, we need to have something more uh, um, engaging to be able to include the, the consular corps, especially the African consular corps, which is, you know, looking for ways to have support from you and working and engagement with you and commitment so we can do a better job with the diasporas and the constituents. So I would just, uh, uh, you know, um, my president, uh, Maki Sal is pres was the president of the African Union. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I've been to the United Nations summit where he was talking about these issues within the African countries. And I would like to see what we can do here on the West Coast to be able to be more working with our governments and in our the government of the United States to be able to do a better job with what's happening right now here in the diaspora. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and that's something I take to heart. I mean, the, the first time I came out to USC, um, Jay invited me to come and speak at Annenberg. Um, I think it was two, 2010. I was Assistant Secretary for, for Public Affairs. And one of the responsibilities of my job then and still of the State Department is to reach out to all of America. You know, we're not just in Washington or talking to uh, the, the, as we call it, the inside the beltway crowd, that we need to engage our fellow citizens throughout the United States to help uh, them understand and you understand what it is that we're doing on your behalf, how we are promoting America's interests abroad, how we're creating jobs abroad, how we're trying to bring uh, better security uh, at home through our relationships abroad how we fight disease abroad so it doesn't come to the shores of the United States. I was in, in uh, DRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We had four Ebola outbreaks during my time there. None of them came to the United States. Why? Because we were building uh, partnerships with the Congolese, building capacity and better able to respond to the potential of an Ebola uh, outbreak to prevent it from going cross borders. And so it's that kind of international cooperation that is essential. But you're right. I mean, and I very much appreciate your engagement and your being here, taking time out of your day on a Monday morning to, to have this exchange. And we should do more of it. And now, especially with the, what we've discovered under COVID, that you can do everything virtually and we have people watching online, it's, it's easier. And I hope that my colleagues at the State Department will, will do more of it to have these exchanges, to his, listen to your views. I was also impressed. I met with uh, Mayor Bass um during this visit and i knew from before because a colleague of mine was the deputy mayor of los angeles for international affairs and uh and, and so uh with nina Hashigian. and so she's come into to the foreign service now working at the state department uh but you know in la you actually have a, a, a deputy mayor uh which shows the focus of los angeles to the rest of the world which is tremendous and you may have seen there have been now initiatives uh, for, for the, you know, the State Department to engage uh, with cities across the country to engage more with local politicians and make those connections because the world is more and more interconnected. And everywhere I travel, I'll meet somebody who knows somebody who was almost a neighbor in some other country where I've been. <laughs> That's how small the world has become. And so, uh, again, I really appreciate hearing uh, from you. and. Uh, that you know, I will take back to Washington. That yes, more of my colleagues should do this more frequently. You know, not only about Africa, but all kinds of uh, you know issues 
that are uh, relevant uh, to to Americans about what is happening uh, elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mao Tukunenbai. I'm the Honorary Council of Senegal, representing the African Council for here. Terrific. No, and, and, I, and I understand that uh, Mayor Bass is working on a very special guest to come out and address you. I can't uh, make it public, but she told me about it. So I know that she's working to try to get high-level State Department officials to come here and engage with the uh, African con Consular Court. Yes, and even when she was a Congresswoman, yeah. she, was, she would meet with the African Consular Court several mm -hmm. times. And then, you know, we met again when she, uh, she, she, was, in a, she was a mayor, got to be a man, and then we discussed uh, uh, plausible things that we can do together. Yeah. So we just wanted to have more engagement with that. Yeah, terrific. All right. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, I know we have also uh, online uh, attendees, you know, who are waiting for, you know, to to share their uh, questions. And I know uh, one of our board member, Dr. Mariana, is online. I, I think we can come back to the audience now because you know some of uh, you know our attendees are you know from uh, different African countries. You know, it's very late now, so let's give them a chance if they have any questions, and then we'll come back to you, sir. And then here as well. And yeah, so we have like uh, four or five more uh, questions, if that's okay. I think we're running out of time. Okay. Yes. So uh, we might be actually out of time. I don't know, maybe one two questions. Mm -hmm. is, is that I, have, I have a few more there? minutes. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, we have such a nice crowd here. I don't know about it <laughs> virtually, but. Uh, okay. okay. So, uh, yeah. gentlemen. Hi, Ambassador Hammer. Hi. Uh, my name is Iskander Zodu. I'm the uh, co-founder of Balamoya. It's a platform to uh, share and celebrate Ethiopian food culture. Oh, nice. Um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that we that we do is just to highlight the diversity of Ethiopian food. You know, given this time, I think it's important to highlight uh, the diversity of the, of the culture to promote unity. Um, and so just in line, um, one, very excited to see the nominations coming to committee this week. Uh, like the, the ambassador to Ethiopia, as, as well as other uh, am ambassadors. Just wanted to get a sense from you on, um, you know, your relationship with Senator Coons um, uh, and just your experience with us, uh, Senator Coons, and also just how we can, um, how we can support Ethiopia and, you know, who, who has very fertile ground um, to help address food insecurity. Because, you know, a lot of times I think it, the solution seems to be, you know, external supply of food. But as we know, there uh, are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of potential for agriculture uh, in the country. And, and how can you know, the U.S. Um, help, uh, you know, Ethiopia realize that potential? Yeah, thanks. Let me say a couple of things. Uh, one, you know, in the State Department, going back to certainly the Obama administration when Secretary Clinton was secretary, they put a real effort and focus on culinary diplomacy, you may be aware. Our Congress uh, is engaged on, on issues uh, pertaining to Africa. Uh, you know, we need to have the proper staffing at our embassies to be able to carry out U.S. foreign policy that requires resources and funding, which only the Congress can provide us. Uh, and uh, we need to have our ambassadors out in the field. They need to be confirmed. And so, yes, I'm hoping that my colleague Irv Mazinga, who has a hearing um, tomorrow, uh, will will sail through. Uh, the point is that we need our ambassadors to be leading our teams, and that needs to go through a Senate confirmation process, and I hope that that moves more expeditiously. Uh, but to your question or, or issue on food insecurity, it's one that uh, Secretary Blinken discussed with Prime Minister Abiy when he was there in Addis on, on March 15th, because you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not just about providing food. In fact, what you want to do is for the countries to be able to provide their own food and to grow um, in uh, their own uh, you know, agricultural sectors. And that was something that we discussed because you need to combat food insecurity. And yes, it's fantastic what we do in terms of humanitarian assistance, 
and prov providing food uh, uh, stuffs for individuals, but it's even better if they can develop uh, themselves. And so we do try to do that. More needs to be done. Uh, the issues were of, of seed and fertilizer, and there's a fertilizer shortage. And so I very much welcome, you know, citizen engagement, if you will, on looking for how to 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 strengthen those uh, agricultural sectors. I mean, there, you know, I served in DRC. It could, you know, it's it has the potential to feed most of Africa. Uh, you know, you hear about the breadbasket that that Sudan could be if ever you could get to a peaceful. Uh, environment. Uh, you hear about Zimbabwe. So the, the the ability to feed people is there. It's just the, the politics and the conflict has gotten in the way. So we need to do more, but I very much appreciate your interest in, in bringing that to, to the fore. One more, maybe one more question here. Actually, there was a gentleman, yeah, in the back. Yeah, hi, my name is Tad. Uh, I don't think nobody wants to meet you today more than me because I'm from Tigray. Uh, one quick question to you is, did you see people getting burned alive? Did you see that picture? I've seen lots of things on Twitter. Yes, yeah. and the, the, the troops from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and the National Army of Amhara tying up people and throwing them to the river that crosses joins the Nile, the Kelly River. Uh, my, my, what I'm saying maybe is strange to everybody, but I have pictures anybody want to see. Army is taking picture of selfie, people burning alive. These Tigray people are the only people in Africa. They have their own numbers and alphabets. And they're also blamed to be descendants of Israel, the security chief of Ethiopia said they need to be wiped out. And DNA also proves to be they have more blood of Jewish descendants, which I want, I'm one of them. I didn't know about that, but I'm Christian. The, but they say I, I, my descendants are from Israel, uh, so on and so forth. But my main thing is, did, I want you, did you see the, the, the people getting burned alive? That's it. Well, again, let me just end where we started, which is, you know, the Biden administration recognized, you know, the importance of the Horn of Africa and stability in Ethiopia. And that's why they appointed the, the position of the special envoy for the Horn of Africa, which I now have. And it was my single most important responsibility to try to bring an end to the conflict. And we're pleased that through the efforts that we've done with the African Union and other partners that right now there's a cessation of hostilities agreement that is holding, that has brought to an end most of the violence, although there's still human rights violations being committed. And the United States is urging that there be a credible uh, transitional justice uh, process as well as uh, accountability for those who are responsible for the atrocities, war crimes and crimes against humanity that the State Department uh, made very clear to the world that have happened uh, in northern Ethiopia. And so I appreciate you bringing that issue. I appreciate your passion. Uh, it's what we do as diplomats is try to bring an end to situations like that. And then as the United States to see what is possible in terms of, again, advancing human rights, not only in Ethiopia, but around the world. And so uh, sometimes we succeed right now in Ethiopia Things are trending in the right direction, but the work, as I said, uh, still lies ahead to ensure that it's a lasting peace and that they're not new conflicts. For example, in Oromia, or you see now in the Amhara region, there's uh, quite a bit of concern. So again, thank you for, for your thoughts and thanks uh, everyone who's come out. I know there's still a number of questions mm -hmm. and, and so forth, but you know, again, I don't want to abuse everyone's time either. So yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mike. Uh... I appreciate that. Uh, and Professor, we have also uh, Evans coming up. You know, we're collaborating with the State Department to have the same kind of conversation on issues uh, in Sudan. So uh, please feel free, you know, to to join us or to uh, you know reach you know reach to us. And this is exactly what we are doing, you know, at US African Institute. You know, bringing people together closer.
to have you know, a deeper conversation, you know, honest conversation about you know, our past and present and future you know, to resolve you know, you know, our differences in a peaceful way, you know, in a conversational you know, way like this one. And I appreciate again, you know, uh, Ambassador Hammer and also your uh, staff, uh, Nora, for helping us you know, uh, coordinate you know, this uh, conversation in uh, the Center on Public Diplomacy. Uh, Dr. J, thank you so much. And also, uh, also Cesar and the whole staff. I uh, appreciate everyone for coming here today.